Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're pleased to have you join us for the California Current Acidification Network Ocean Acidification Roundtable discussion for July 2019. The title of today's presentation is Genetics of Larval Fitness in the Pacific Oyster, Responses to Acidified Seawater and Temporally Dynamic Selection Processes. This series is hosted by the California Current Acidification Network. In short, the series is intended to create a dialogue among industry members, natural resource managers, and scientists within the California Current ecosystem with awareness of and access to the research and its applications and uses. The participants will be able to collaborate to better understand and adapt to ocean acidification moving forward. Evan, if you could advance the slide. Oh, sorry. That's all right. I'm Terry King with the Washington Sea Grant Program and Chair of the California Current Acidification Network Steering Committee, and I'll be moderating today's session as well as running the logistics behind the scene. During the presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type questions related to technical issues or questions for the presenter in the questions box at the bottom of the control panel on the right of your screen. I will be monitoring incoming questions and will respond to them or pose them to our speaker after their presentation. We're also recording this session and we'll share the recording on the California Current Acidification Network website in the future. We're very excited to have Dr. Evan Durland speaking with us today, all the way from Sweden. We have a number of other international um, uh, uh, researchers on the call today. I believe our furthest is the Galapagos, which will be very interesting to see if her connection holds through the entire presentation. Dr. Evan Durlin is a postdoc at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and a former student of Chris Langdon's. His current project is focusing on optimizing the farming of mussels and kelp as bioremediators with semi-enclosed salmon farms in Norway. Evan received his Bachelor's of Science from Colorado State University, a Master's in Aquaculture from Auburn University in Alabama, and his PhD in Fisheries from, Ocean, from Oregon State University just a few months ago. In between degrees, he also worked breeding oysters for the Molluscan Broodstock Program and for private aquaculture companies in Indonesia, growing both grouper and pearl oysters. Evan, I'll leave everything to you. You have complete control. All right. Oh, missed the slide. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining me tonight, or today, tonight for me, um, for this webinar. So, I'll be talking about some of the work I did with Oregon State University at the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, um, with my dissertation. And as Terry said, my talk was about the genetics of larval oysters, uh, both how they respond to acidified seawater, as well as temporally dynamic selection processes. Evan, can you speak a little closer to the microphone, just to project a little bit? Yep, you got it. Thank you. Um, all right, so to get started, uh, we'll familiarize ourselves with our species. I think most of the people sitting in today are familiar with the Pacific oyster. Um, but this is an oyster species that came from the Western Pacific and has made it to the shores of Korea, Japan, and China. Um, it was brought over to the West Coast of the United States in the 1920s to replace the collapse of the native oyster industry in uh, lower that. Uh, it's a very resilient oyster. So you can see some of the reefs here in Guelpa Bay uh, can be uh, inhabit high density cultures that can withstand being aired out for days at a time, can withstand being frozen for hours at a time. It's also highly trepani, so you can see a picture of the larvae, a video of the larvae up in the upper left here. <clears throat> a female can produce millions of larvae per spawn and can spawn multiple times. Evan, so I hate to do this, but we're having a hard time hearing you. Could you? maybe speak a little louder or closer to the microphone? Yeah, I'm about as close as I can be. I'll, I'll try and pitch up the voice. Um, okay. Yeah, let me know if, it, if we continue to have problems. Uh, yeah, so some of these uh, physical characteristics of this animal make it very attractive to aquifers. So it's now the most widely farmed species globally. These are some farms in Oregon and Newcart Bay. That's another oyster I took from. Um, so that's high resilience to environmental stress and high fecundity make it a very good aquifer protector. And these characteristics have led this species on something of a worldwide tour. So like I say, it's made it to the Western Pacific there, and we brought it over in the 20s. And subsequently, this species has been transplanted to every continent on the globe. Um, and places in green here are areas where it's colonized and has self-recruiting populations. Uh, those blue areas are places where it's been brought for farming opportunities, and in some places it's still farmed, or other places no longer. 
However, the point is that this species uh, has been successful in a wide range of environments um, across the globe. Here on the West Coast, we farm the Pacific oyster from the, uh, all states on the Pacific Coast, so as far south as California and all the way up into Alaska. Across this range, the most substantial commercial uh, recruit, uh, naturally recruited stocks are in Washington State, notably Willapa Bay in, in Washington, southwest Washington, as well as the Hood Canal region near Japan. It's a pretty significant aquaculture industry on the West Coast, accounting for around $80 million in farm gate sales a year, and really uh, the backbone of a broader shellfish community, uh, accounting for about a quarter billion dollars in the United States. So it's a significant contribution to these coastal economies. So, uh, yep. Evan, um, could you maybe put in the, we didn't, I, I will apologize to everyone. We tried the mic and it, it ended up working fine and now it seems like it's not. Can you plug in the earphones again and see if that helps? You got it. Okay. We think that part of this is the, you know, people in Sweden are all online. Obviously it's nine o'clock at night and maybe it's an issue of the wire and the way that we're connecting. Can you hear me any better now? Yes. Okay, so we'll go with that. All right, so um, we're all pretty familiar with the adult oyster, but what I'll be talking about most today is the larval phases of this animal, which uh, to me are the most interesting part of its life cycle. Um, so it's a sessil broadcast spawner, as we all know. So it sits in one place for all of its life and emits sperm and eggs into the water column where they hopefully meet and fertilize to produce an embryo. And then it goes through a series of developmental stages during its larval phase. Um, and I've highlighted some of the stages here. This first one on the left here, D larvae, is the first shelled veliger stage. So shortly after fertilization, within 24 hours, um, the animal undergoes a dramatic transformation to become this fully swimming and feeding veliger larvae. This is also the phase of initial calcification. So they create their shell very rapidly at about 12 to 18 hours post-fertilization. Um, they're this full organism by 24 hours. Then for the next two to three weeks, they undergo a series of, uh, or they, they continue to grow and feed and acquire nutrients through these veliger stages up here um, until they reach this final swimming stage called the pediveliger. It's called pediveliger because they actually grow a foot that extends out of their shell where they start searching for substrates, some place they want to settle down for the rest of their life. At this stage, they undergo a final transformation from swimming larvae to this juvenile spat. So this, again, is a very dramatic transformation, um, and they rearrange a lot of their body and their organs and become this, this final juvenile oyster that we are more familiar with. So one of the things that has really been a key component of increasing the success of the oyster across the world has been uh, hatchery production of seed. So initially, all stocks were supplied by naturally recruited populations, both in Japan as well as here on the West Coast in Washington. But after a series of years where that recruitment was a bit spotty, um, we developed the hatchery techniques to grow these things in optimal conditions and expand their, their adult growing region um, substantially. So the second thing that growing things in a hatchery and closing the life cycle allows is for an improvement of the organism. So starting in 1995, Chris Langdon started the Molluscan Broodstock Program here at, or at Oregon State University. And for the past 20 years, we've been breeding oysters for improved field traits at farm environments. So that's growth and survival in estuarine environments across the Pacific coast. Currently in the seventh generation of selection and um, have substantial gains over the wild stocks in a lot of environments. But the main challenge for oyster aquaculture in the past decade has been the aspect of ocean acidification. And I think, again, most people sitting in tonight, today, um, are familiar with OA. Uh, just briefly, it's the process whereby we're dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. It's getting absorbed by the oceans and making it more acidic, which makes it more difficult for marine calcifying organisms to create shell and survive uh, in these environments. On the right, you see the IPCC projected atmospheric CO2 levels. And the takeaway here is uh, it's a problem for us now where we're sitting here around this 400 mark. And this problem is only going to get worse through the end of the century. So in the best case scenario, if we stop emitting carbon dioxide, we'll still see it climb up to just under 600 parts per million. In the worst case scenario, this could climb up to 1,000 parts per million. So it's a problem um, that we need to be getting our heads around and getting ahead of now. So it's a global problem, but we're feeling those effects more acutely here on the West Coast due to uh, <clears throat> natural weather patterns. And so we get these summer north winds that drive coastal waters offshore 
They're replaced by deep ocean water masses that are rich in carbon. So we get PCO2 levels that climb up above uh, 1100, 1200, and we get pH levels that drop below 7.7, 7.6 every summer now. This has been a significant problem for the uh, shellfish aquaculture community on the West Coast. And since 2007, it's been accountable for significant losses in the hatcheries. So some years up to 75% redu reduced production and losses up to $10 million a year for these small businesses. Overall, the production of gigas has decreased in the past decade, although we're seeing some rebound. Um, and so it's a big, a big deal for the West Coast in how to, to adapt to these new uh, environmental conditions. Now, what remains a little bit less well known is how these conditions affect natural stocks. So for example, Willapa Bay. We know that they're exposed to upwelling in the summer months and they experience uh, acidified seawater conditions, but it's difficult to tie the, the naturally stochastic patterns of spawning and recruitment with these also stochastic patterns of upwelling. But we have good reason to believe that these are not helping those wild stocks as well, and they're being exposed to these acidified conditions as well as the aquaculture populations. All right, so to summarize 10 years and an extensive amount of research in one slide. So this has um, been something of interest for a lot of research groups to understand how these conditions specifically are affecting the biology of uh, shellfish, specifically oysters. Um, and one of the big takeaways, it has to do with calcification. So like I said, at this early development stage, they're forming that first shell very quickly and um, <clears throat> when they're fully exposed to the seawater conditions. So this is some iconic work from George Waldbusser and Ellen Barton, demonstrating that the association of larval development, early larval development uh, and aragonite saturation uh, strongly dictates the success of these larvae. So you can see on the top here, on the left is percent normal. That's the percentage of these D larvae that have a normal shape, which is depicted on the bottom in the picture. And on the right, you have larval size. And in both cases, you can see as we decrease our aragonite saturation state, we get fewer normal and those larvae are smaller. So this is dramatically impacting that uh, cal the effect, uh, the ability of these animals to calcify in these conditions. So a lot of research effort has been focusing on this early development period and how uh, calcification and larval processes are affected in acidified conditions. But the rest of the life cycle there has received relatively less attention. And that's for good reasons. Um, partially because it's difficult to grow larvae all the way through to settlement. Also because that settlement uh, is very difficult to capture and quantify. So we have a lot less information on the long-term or chronic effects of acidification on larval fitness. And furthermore, we have extremely little knowledge on what genetic consequences these stresses have. So we anticipate that this is a pretty serious stress on these organisms, but we haven't yet really grasped um, how that might act as a selection pressure to change the genetic composition of some of these larval groups uh, for this organism. More applied, we don't know if there's differential sensitivity between stocks in the Northwest. There's some evidence from Australia that different stocks are differentially sensitive to OA. In the Northwest, we don't have any kind of baseline reference whether stuff in Willapa or Puget Sound differs in its sensitivity to OA relative to something like the Molluscan Foodstock Program. So all that sets the scene for the, the three main uh, subjects I'd like to talk about today. So the first part will cover some of the research I've been doing with looking at the phenotypic effects of ocean acidification on larval oysters. So that's the chronic long-term effects on development and recruitment to spat. And specifically also, is there a difference between larvae that come from those selected lines or MVP and those that come from naturalized populations in Willapa Bay? In the second part, we'll take samples from the same experiments and look at the changes in genetic composition of those larval groups in ambient and acidified seawater. So our questions are, does, it affect, does uh, larval culture in acidified conditions have genetic consequences on those, those animals? And how are they similar or different between MVP and Willapa? And then for this last section, uh, it's really diving more into the dynamic temporal changes in genotype frequency in these groups during larval development. Um, there's been some work looking at the effect of genetic load on these populations, and we have now data that can kind of resolve that with, uh, with better resolution, um, looking at how some of these changes take place during development. All right, so jumping straight in. So the experiments that I conducted, which are the framework for all this data, um, were conducted in 2015 and 2016. 
And in the beginning, our goal was simply to compare MVP to Willapa. So to that end, we took Willapa wilds from the Nacelle region in Southern Bay in 2015 um, and brought those into the lab for a year. We brought them in in 2014 for a 2015 spawn. Brought those into the lab, conditioned them um, alongside MVP stocks. So we pulled our top families from the fifth and sixth generation. Um, and we took a lot of those families to create a diverse pool. We'll talk about it in a second. We repeated this experiment in 2016 um, and got oysters from North Bay, which is more exposed to upwelling, um, up here in Stony Point region um, to replicate the experiment. So in both cases, we brought all these broodstock in and our goal was to create a big diverse gene pool for experimentation. And this is important because we know that there's likely to be some differences between individual families and we really wanted to homogenize that effect. So we created 95 crosses from each of these stocks in each of these years um, to get this kind of mean fitness for that entire population. And in the case of MVP, because we have a pedigree, we can actually recreate that pool. So for 2016 spawn, we went back to those same families and remade that pool as close as we could um, to really kind of replicate the genetic stock in those experimental conditions. So for this, we use static culture. Um, we use these 10-liter polycarbonate buckets uh, with a screw lid and a rubber seal. And we used uh, PCO2 levels with ambient at 400 parts per million and high PCO2 of 1,600. Now, if you're familiar with the literature, 1,600 is pretty high for OA stress, but it's also realizable on the West Coast. Uh, every year, we see uh, acidification levels getting up to 1,600 parts per million. So we consider it a relatively high but realistic um, stress for these animals. We reared them for about three weeks, uh, 22 days in 2015 and 24 days in 2016, and changing water every other day to keep the conditions fresh. In 2016, we added a sixth replicate to each of these levels um, to, to fortify our statistical strength. And like I said, our goal here was not only to look at that initial development, to, but to look at the long-term effects. So we have samples throughout the larval development period, including uh, through settlement and those spat populations. And we're looking at total number surviving, the size of those individuals, their developmental progression, and of course also their genetic composition. Okay, so jumping into some of the results, um, this is kind of the high altitude view of the results from both these experiments. So we have 2015 on top, in 2016 on bottom, and this is the total larval survival. And the first thing you will notice on this graph is that there doesn't seem to be much difference. And that's kind of the point, that when you look at the larval phenotypes from a high altitude and say, what's the overall outcome? You can't detect much of a difference. Um, and it really involves breaking it down into these individual phases of that larval development to understand how these conditions are affecting the larval physiology and what the differences are between these two broodstock groups. So we'll be talking about this initial phase or early development, also the middle phase or veliger stages, and then finally this metamorphic transition to spat. So we're starting with that early development period. So from day zero to day two or 48 hours post-fertilization, um, these are some of the typical metrics we see looking at OA work. On the left, we have survival. On the right, we have percent normal. And the takeaway here is that uh, we didn't have an overall effect of acidified conditions on, a, on total survival. In fact, it was gently positive. In each case, we had slightly more larvae in those acidified conditions. But what we did see was that the normality was significantly reduced. And this is the somewhat classical response to OA conditions, where we get this lower percentage normal. And in each year, we saw a reduction in those percent normal. So to kind of summarize these effects, um, high PCO2, had a relatively consistent increase in total survival, but a decrease in the percent normal. The broodstock effect here was variable and really not that significant. So it was kind of up in one year for MVP and down in another, and no real consistent effect on normality. So we don't have a strong broodstock effect in these early development phenotypes. As we move into these villager stages, the striking thing is that all the differences we saw early on disappeared. Um, in both years, we had very consistent survival and growth in our conditions uh, through to that pedivillager stage. So we saw the same amount of mortality and growth um, both in MBP and Willapa, low CO2, high CO2. So no real changes that were apparent earlier on carried through to this villager period. As we approach this pedivillager period, we go through that last transition to SPAT, and this is where things start getting, getting interesting again. 
So here is total larval survival. That's the survival of every of the larvae um, on the left and the settlement success on the right. And that's that those that were from, went from petavelager to spat. So what we saw here was striking differences between both these experiments. So in 2015, the survival was not affected by high PCO2 culture and there wasn't a real big difference between MVP and Willify. The total spat success also wasn't that different between low CO2 and high CO2, but MVP did appear to have more spat. In 2016, we saw what would be maybe the more expected response, and that's that we had a much lower survival of larvae down here, and the settlement was reduced, about 42% less spat um, coming out of those high PCO2 cultures. So again, to summarize, we have MBP having no real effect on survival across both those uh, experiments, but a consistently improved settlement success. High PCO2 culture had this weirdly uh, variable response to this uh, performance metric where in one year it didn't affect them at all and the next year it had a dramatic negative impact. So the struggle at this point was to understand um, how those two things fit together and the real clue here was looking at the nature of the mortality and this is again an important component is understanding how things are dying in your culture and not just how many are dying. And so in this case and, and when we look at the samples from 2016 at the final time point we see that the, all the mortality that we saw, 99% was happening in these underdeveloped larvae, which is depicted by these kind of white shells here, and not in the petavelagers and not in the spat. So that's an important distinction. What that means is that the larvae weren't trying and dying, it's that they were withheld from getting to that settlement competent state where they could even try and settle out. And that fits with some other work from colleagues down in California, looking at the metabolic uh, costs of survival in high CO2 environments. So this is some work from Frieder um, last year and looking at the metabolic cost and the metabolic partitioning um, in these conditions. So the top graph really demonstrates the, pro the, the efficiency of these animals in high CO2 environments. So this is the protein depositional efficiency. Um, as you can see, as you get to high PCO2, which in this case was around 1100, um, they get much less efficient at creating new protein. In this bottom pie chart, demonstrates two different strategies. So in control CO2, you have 66% that goes to protein synthesis of the ATP, and the remaining is for maintenance. As you get to middle CO2, they pump up the protein, but as you get to high PCO2, they increase the total metabolic pool, so they're requiring more energy, and their efficiency goes way down. So those observations fit with what we saw in 2016 in that these animals simply just couldn't keep up in this high demand environment. And the other corroborating bit of evidence comes from the broodstock. So one thing we saw straight away in 2016 was that the condition of the broodstock was much worse. On the top here, you can see the total number of eggs we got out of each female on average. So up here, we had 300,000 per female. And then down here, we had considerably less. We could just see that from looking at the broodstock, they were in poor condition. Now, curiously, that didn't equate into energetic content of the eggs. We did lipid analyses and actually the uh, the eggs in 2016 had more lipid uh, than they did in 2015. So it's not simple energetics, but something in there about the egg quality. And you'll notice we don't have Willapa for 2016. That's because uh, those samples got contaminated. But what this experiment taught us was that OA is certainly an important factor in dictating the performance of larvae. And it's an important factor for the chronic effects, but it's not the only one and it interacts with numerous other stressors, right? So it's interacting with energetics as well as temperature, which other papers have shown us. Also things that are happening in the natural environment like hypoxia and diseases and microflora blooms. So really OA is one of the major stressors, but we have to integrate that into a broader context of all the other things that are happening to the larvae at this time. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot more uh, kind of of the discussion part of this, this project, and you can see that in our, our new publication in MAPS, if you care to look it up. But um, this was an interesting uh, takeaway from a messy data set, where sometimes when you find things you didn't expect to see, uh, it can paint something of a, a richer picture. So to summarize the phenotypic effects of growth in these OA environments, um, what we see is that high PCO2 here had very, uh, consistent effects in early development. So we had a general improvement in survival and a significant decrease in percent normal, um, but we had some variable effects of high PCO2 over the settlement period. However, despite all that, 
MVP continued to produce more and bigger spat in both those conditions in both those years. So MVP had 55% more spat in ambient and 37% on average more spat in high PCO2 environments that were also bigger. So 5% bigger in ambient and 23% in high CO2. So that was an interesting takeaway that MVP had maintained a, a performance advantage um, across that amount of variability. So that uh, brings us to this next question. If this has to do with genetics um, from some unintended source with our broodstock program, what can we observe with changes in genetic composition of these larvae uh, in both normal and acidified environments? So to get at that question, we took samples from our 2015 trial and we're looking at the overall change from start to finish in these groups. So at day two and day 22, and we're looking at this total genetic change over development in both those conditions. Uh, we can conceptualize this in another way, and that's that we have this big diverse gene pool going into this experiment. So 95 crosses in each of those groups. And the question we're kind of asking is, how do those compositions look in ambient and how do they look in high CO2 environments? And are those changes consistent between our selected lines and our wild stocks? So traditionally, the way you'd evaluate this is by genotyping a good number of individuals. And when you in genotype an individual, you get um, their, their genotype. So you get two alleles. In this case, this is a heterozygote. It has A or B, or A and B, or homozygote has A, A. Well, in the case of oysters, uh, they're quite small and difficult to sequence individuals. And as, as of yet, you can't really get enough DNA out of them for uh, modern sequencing platforms. So we adopted a pool seek approach. And this is where you take a bunch of larvae and you extract all of their DNA and you sequence all of that DNA. So the drawback from this approach is that you lose individual genotypes. So you get this, this whole mix of different alleles and you can't call genotypes, you call minor allele frequencies. In this example, we would observe six A alleles, four B alleles, and we would calculate a minor allele frequency or the frequency of B at 40%. So for the rest of this, we're going to be talking about minor allele frequencies, and that's what that means, is that among that entire population, how many of those alleles do we see? So uh, we had 1,288 SNPs across the genome um, that met our coverage thresholds. I won't go too much into detail in the methods. If you're curious, I'm happy to talk about all my trials and tribulations, figuring out how to use the pool seek method. Um, but essentially, we took all these markers, these individual nucleotide variation, and we modeled it in terms of the developmental stage, so day two or 22, the treatment, which is low or high CO2, and the interaction between those. And so this is one way we can look at that data. Um, and so on the top, we have just ambient conditions over the two different time frames. So we have just day two samples here on the x-axis and just uh, day 22 samples in the y-axis. So what this graph is showing you, the scatter plot, is the starting frequency on the x-axis, if it changed nothing at all, it would lie in this 45 degree line. Any distance from that line is a distortion in the allele frequency, either up or down by day 22. The highlighted dots are those that were found significantly different by that model uh, after false discovery correction. So these blue dots are those that are changing under developmental processes. Um, and on the bottom, we have a different comparison. That's the comparison of just SPAT but between ambient and high PCO2 conditions. So on the left, we have MVP, and the right, we have Willapa. And what we see here is that we get substantially more distortion from those Willapa wilds um, in those high CO2 environments. Now, these purples are those interactive SNPs. We'll look at that in the next slide. So when we look at all those changes to, all together, what some of the first takeaways are, A, that Willapa is changing more than MVP. So they had 26% more markers uh, that were changing in ambient or control conditions than MVP, but they had 223% more that were changing in high CO2 conditions than MVP. So they were much more genetically affected by those high CO2 environments than our selected lines. And that alone is a pretty interesting takeaway, but <clears throat> there's another aspect that was really eyebrow raising for us. And if you look at the right here, this is a cross tabulation of how each of those markers uh, fits out with the other group. So we have Willapa on top and MVP on the side here. Um, for example, Willapa for stage effects or just developmental effects, we had 145 markers that changed significantly for that group. 
if you look up here in the red box, only four of those also changed in MVP for that same reason. And that's true for each of these categories as you go down. So we have development, high CO2 exposure, the additive, that's both of them together, and the interactive here. And across that diagonal, you see very, very few markers actually were consistent between these two groups. So this was a very big surprise as well. We would fully expect that that the changes in one group should be reflected somewhat, at least, in the other group, but that was not the case here. Now, another way to look at this is, are similar regions of the genome changing? So this could be that, yes, yes, they're not the same markers changing in the same way, but it all kind of translates back to some, maybe, arm of chromosome that's changing. So when we look at this uh, linkage analysis, so this is based off the linkage maps from Dennis Hedgecock, um, we can see that these changes are more or less evenly dispersed across the genome. So it doesn't appear to be the case that they're changing in consistent regions of the genome. The changes in Willapa are much more profound. You can see that from their p-values here. And they're not consistent with what's changing in MVP. So there's one further way that we can try and make these uh, make sense and be more similar. And that's that we can look at their functional uh, their putative function of the genes around each of those markers. So this is functional enriching analysis. And conceptually, what that is, is we take a marker, which is the star here, we go for a search on the annotated genome, upstream and downstream, looking for genes in that region. And then we take those genes and put them into a program and say, okay, uh, are there more of one function than other functions being represented from those markers that are changing? So we used ermine J for this. And this is uh, the takeaway from these developmental effects. So what you can see here is that we have very broad processes for developmental effects. And that's protein modification, helicase, uh, anion binding, metabolic processes. And the important part here is twofold. One, very few genes fall into those categories. So they're very poorly represented. And they're also very broadly functional. So this is a, a score from zero to one of how, how specific it is with higher numbers being more broad. So for developmental processes, what we see is that they're affecting uh, a large number of processes in both these groups. Now contrast that with the same analysis on those that are changing for high CO2 environments. And what we found is something very different. In this case, even though there's fewer uh, markers that were affected by those environments, they're much more strongly overrepresented by specific components of physiology. In this case, it's, it's membranes. So we have integral component of membrane, membrane part, and just membrane in general. And again, these are many more genes that are ascribing to these, these categories. They're much more specific, and those p-values are stronger. So that was a very uh, compelling takeaway. This fits also with what we know from other work about the importance of membranes in survival in, in acidified environments. So we have a, a number of other groups looking at urchins and oysters, demonstrating that transmembrane transport of ions is one way, not only do they maintain homeostasis within the cells, but it's also a way that they foster calcification. Um, so this left figure here is modified from a paper we did about shell formation. And in, with some gene expression work, we also identified transmembrane proteins as one of the upregulated groups uh, in high CO2 stress. This last paper here, Ramish, um, they actually showed empirical evidence that they were doing this. So what they did is they took a muscle larvae, suctioned it onto a pipette, and inserted a probe right in that area of calcification and demonstrated that the organism is actually modifying this calcification and this calcifying fluid. So this space where the calcification is taking place, they're making it more advantageous for the deposition of calcium carbonate. So all these activities have to do with transmembrane transport. Um, and that's been shown empirically in these other works. But what this data kind of adds to that picture is not only are they upregulating or increasing the performance, but these functions are also selective. Because we're seeing changes in the genetic composition of these groups, this means that this is a selective pressure for these activities. So what we saw overall was MVP had less genetic change overall than Willapa, and that's consistent with what we saw from the survival trends. We saw increased survival and settlement success. Um, so collectively, that provides us a little bit of evidence for domestication in MVP lines, meaning that they're surviving better and changing less, probably because they've been selected for this kind of uniform, stable hatching environment. The disparate changes are a bit of a mystery. Um, they imply either that there's different physiological processes being selected in each of these stocks, or that they've differentiated enough 
from one another that the markers um, aren't relevant to one another. The encouraging bit is that under those high PCO2 conditions, the genetic changes do appear to have some functional similarity, even if the individual markers changing are different. And then the last thing I'd like to highlight on this section of the work is to remember that we saw in this year's experiment in 2015, no significant difference in survival in high CO2 environments. But nevertheless, we demonstrated there is significant genetic change. And in Willapa, there was two times more change than in, than in the MVP. So what this means is even if we're not seeing a mortality event, there are having effects on that population that might carry on to future generations. Furthermore, it means that there's probably some trade-offs. So as some things are dying in ambient conditions that are surviving in OA, you're getting a shift in the fitness optima. Okay, so that is kind of the overall effects. Um, but another big part of this, this puzzle is what are the temporal changes uh, that are taking place in these larval populations across the development? Um, so kind of asking when and how do these genetic changes occur? So if we recall from that last bit, uh, a full quarter of all the markers we queried showed some signal of change over development. And that's quite a bit when you think about it. 25% of all the markers across the genome showed a signal of change. Uh, this is consistent with some of the estimates from previous work by Lewis Plow, Dennis Hedgecock, looking at the effect of genetic load on larval survival and genotype frequencies in larvae. And over a series of papers, they demonstrated or suggested that there's 11 to 19 deleterious loci present in the oyster genome that renders around 90% of all larvae genetically inviolable. Now that's a staggering uh, statement, but it is borne out with the genotype distortions. Um, and what I mean by genotype distortions is kind of depicted here on the right. So uh, for this work, they used a lot of microsatellite markers and they genotyped individual uh, spat and compared that to the genotype combinations that would come from the parents. So on the left bar, you see the genotype composition coming from parents. So in a heterozygote cross, you would get 25% of the AA genotype 25% of the BB genotype, and 50% of the AB genotype. Then by the end of the larval period, at day 22, what they observed was a distortion in that frequency. So in this case, we reduce our BB genotype, and that suggests that those alleles um, are detrimental to those animals because they're causing disproportionate mortality for that genotype. Now, in their 2011 paper, they also did some temporal analyses um, but probably due to the difficulty in amplifying DNA from individual larvae, the number of markers that were available for these uh, intermediate larval stages were limited. Um, so the work that we did kind of expands upon that work and offers some higher resolution uh, examination of patterns of change. So to kind of uh, put it into a framework that's understandable, what the question we're kind of trying to ask is, yes, we know this is the start and end frequency, but can we fill in some of these mystery boxes? Um, is what's happening in between uh, linear or unpredictable, or is it something other? So to get at that, we have uh, samples from that same experiment in ambient. Um, in this case, we used Willapa samples, so wild, type, wild genotypes. And we have samples at uh, the start at the fertilized egg with day two, day six, day 10, 16, and 22. And so we're evaluating the change in minor allele frequency at all those time points. Um, in this case, because we have a large number of samples, we uh, do kind of data gap overlap. We're left with 867 SNPs across the genome. And in this case, we modeled it on a simple model, which is just looking at the effect of age. And importantly, we coded age as a factor, not a linear variable, because as you'll see, a lot of the changes aren't linear. Um, so we had to let that be a factor. So after uh, false discovery correction, we're left with 516 SNPs that were significantly different at uh, one or more time points. So this is a big, messy data set, and I had to develop some different tools to kind of parse some of the signal out of here. And one of the ways we did, we, we did this was um, by using parametric tests and using what I call sequential pairwise two-key tests. So essentially what that does is, using this as an example, um, if you have a SNP that changed in frequency across time, we go back and do pairwise tests to understand that what was, was there a significant change between any two time points? And there's a couple different scenarios you can get from this test. And this first one is an example of what I call a gradual SNP. So 
from start to finish, it's different, but sequential changes are not significantly different. So this has a gradual positive change. Another option is that you have something that we call the unidirectional SNP. So this is something similar to gradual, but a bit more significant where you have one or more time points where that change is significant. So this was, would be during that final metamorphosis, you got a significant change in the real frequency. The third category is called a bi-directional change, or I like to call them flip-flops. And that's where we get a significant change that goes in two directions. So if we start at 50% through early development, it drops in frequency, and then it abruptly switches direction and goes in the opposite direction. So these are the flip-flop SNPs. So we have those three uh, scenarios depicted here on the top. And then we also have the tangent to those curves on the bottom. So this is the change in minor little frequency. And so you can see gradual is just con pretty consistently positive. Unidirectional is consistently negative with one big jump down. And the bidirectional is, is this more dynamic pattern of change. <clears throat> so we have all these different patterns and we had to use a different technique in order to kind of parse some of the, the categorization out of that. And for that, we used k-means cluster analysis. Now k-means cluster analysis is very complicated, but conceptually uh, pretty straightforward. So this is our simulated data. This is just more of the same simulated data. And conceptually what k-means clustering is gonna do is um, use some math to separate things out so that they're more similar in individual groups. So in this hypothetical example, we would cluster out these patterns into these three clusters. So cluster one is all those bi-directional, Cluster two is those gradual, and cluster three is those unidirectional SNP. So this is the simulated data. This is the real data. Um, so you can imagine how intimidating that is to look at the first time. But the clustering analyses do a really good job of teasing out some of the consistent patterns. So in this case, um, it worked out 10 specific clusters, and this is the change in minor allele frequency for all 516 of those significant SNPs. And this is the tangent to those curves. So this is the change in minor allele frequency. And so what we can see here is that in these low clusters, which are highly populated, we get a little wobbling around that line. So you get some significant changes, but they're not overly dramatic. As we work our way up this cluster number, what we see is they're getting more and more dynamic and the swings in are more and more pronounced. And so when you start getting here, you get these overall patterns that are swinging in frequency across those developmental periods, especially up in these high order clusters, right? So when we compare these two methods, they agree pretty nicely. So in these low categories with the light wobbles, we end up seeing a lot more of these gradual SNPs. As we go up in cluster number, we see an increased prevalence of these bi-directional SNPs. So they, they agree pretty well. So that's a pretty confusing graph. And I understand that because it took me six years to figure it out. Um, so there's some pretty interesting implications to these flip-flop patterns of change in allele frequency. And I'm gonna try and put it back in frame in the framework of change in genotypes. So this is that same example of before um, that came from the uh, Plows 2016 paper, where we have this change from 50% minor allele frequency to 35%. And in that case, they knew the genotypes. So they could uh, give us that change in genotype frequency. Well, in our context, we're looking at minor allele frequency. So there's a number of ways I can sort of solve that problem with minor allele frequency. And that could be either of these linear solutions or this gradual solution. And all three of these make sense that at some point in life, uh, that BB genotype was disadvantageous and dropped out of frequency. But these flip-flop patterns imply that there's also a good proportion of these, these markers that are changing uh, in patterns like this. And so if we translate that to changes in genotype frequency, and we can do that, it looks more like something like this. And so the implications here are very different, where before we said, well, it's the BB genotype that is uh, negative or deleterious. In this case, what we see is that we have a prevalence of that AA genotype that eventually gets reversed and then flips back. So this pattern of selection leads you to very different conclusions than looking at start and end point alone. And so what we're suggesting with this data is that, yes, we have our predictable patterns of selection, but we also have a good abundance of patterns that are not predictable and that kind of go against our expectations of how genetic, uh, how some of these markers should be changing in these groups. 
So these patterns are pretty hard to explain how that can be happening, but there's two ways that uh, rationally make sense of these dynamic patterns of change. And the first is if we have the marker near a gene that has contrasting total effects on larval fitness. So in this scenario, gene A would have negative effects early on and then positive effects later in the larval development period. And that would drive the frequency of this marker down and then up. Another scenario is if it's attached or if it's associated with two different genes with contrasting effects. So in this case, gene B is the one driving it down in frequency early on, but gene A drives it back up in the end. So this is called repulsion phase. So this could be one of the scenarios that's driving a lot of this behavior. Now, the big takeaway here is, yes, we saw 32% of all the markers that had significant changes were bidirectional. But it's actually a bit more uh, dramatic than that. If you look at just the start and end points, you would, only, uh, you would only conclude that a very small proportion had actually changed. When you account for these, these temporal changes in those intermediate time points, we have 63% that went through some sort of balancing selection. So that means that start and end points are similar, but at one of those ages in between, we have significant changes. So this is evidence to suggest that there's a lot more going on than would appear on the surface just by looking at start and finish. And this also leads us to perhaps the conclusion that some of this is representative of balancing selection. So I'll talk briefly about balancing selection. Um, typically, uh, in a population, if you have deleterious or negative alleles, the traditional theory suggests that those should be driven down in frequency through selection. Basically, if you die, you lose that from the population. Um, one of the big mysteries with oysters is how can they carry as much load as they seem to have? And there's a couple explanations. One is it appears they have a very high mutation rate. So it's been estimated to, to be about 90 times greater than that of a fruit fly. Um, also, these populations have very non-traditional breeding uh, characteristics. They're driven by low effective population sizes and sweep to reproduction. But this introduces another possible mechanism. And if this balancing selection is taking place, it's also another way where these negative alleles are maintained in the population through this flip-flop pattern. And that might actually fold into our broader concept of the success of this species. So um, like we said, that it, this species has found firm footing on all the continents across the globe and it demonstrated a significant uh, ability to withstand hazardous environments. And this uh, center graph here is from the genome paper. And they demonstrated they have a wealth of genes that have been specialized for a lot of environmental stresses. So perhaps in this case, this balancing selection is one of the mechanisms whereby they maintain their adaptability for future volatile ocean scenarios. So for oysters, perhaps because of this great fecundity, which is more or less unparalleled in the animal kingdom, um, plus their diversity, this allows them to be adapted. So kind of wrapping all this, these concepts up, what we saw from our long-term phenotypic assays was that long-term larval response to OA is complex. Um, it's stage specific. It seems to be much more apparent at those morph morphological transitions, whether that's the early development period or in that settlement phase. Um, and these represent bottlenecks for that population where the stresses can kind of maybe be manifest. But there, it's also uh, interrelated with a lot of other components of that environment, both biotic and abiotic, which may dictate the final outcome of, of that larval population. And we also see a huge variation year to year or between cohorts. And so future work really should be focusing on what are uh, some of the variability to some of these effects rather than what's just the discrete phase that we can show repeated um, effects of OA. But one of the big takeaways for the broodstock program is that MVP did seem to have higher performance across the board compared to wild stocks. But it's important to note, uh, to, to note that this is in hatchery conditions. So we have nothing to suggest that these fitness uh, advantages will be maintained in natural environments where the uh, variation, the, the environmental variation is much more substantial than in hatchery environments. Um, looking at the genetics, we see that there's a lot of genetic changes that are happening just in larval development by itself. Um, that they, te they tend to be uh, with broad physiological properties or physiological functions, um, and there seems to be some differences between those wild and selected lines. But interestingly and encouragingly, 
the effects of OA did be, appear to be much more consistent than just general developmental signal. And specifically, membrane structure and performance uh, appears to be a key component to the survival of these animals in these hazardous environments. So it's important to remember though that larval development is genetically chaotic. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on there that really hasn't been investigated fully yet. Um, and I think that these findings largely fortify some of the previous estimates of genetic load and genetic mediated mortality, and that genetics might dominate a large portion of the mortality um, for this animal. And in this case, uh, balancing selection might make the purging of deleterious genes difficult, but also from a breeding standpoint, it might make uh, the adoption of new traits also difficult if you have this dynamic pattern of selection at a period of life where they're losing over 90% of their population. But the on the encouraging side, MBP has uh, shown improvement in field traits, and now we have some evidence to suggest improvement in larval traits. Um, and we also have a permanent signal on the genetic changes of OA on some of the SPAT. So it does appear that some of these effects can have long-term impacts, um, for better or worse, on the oyster populations. And I think I'm getting near out of time, um, but I'm happy to entertain any questions people have. Um, and if you have any more long form questions, uh, I encourage you to shoot me an email. I'm happy to discuss any of this work with you uh, down the road. Great. Well, thank you, Evan, for your presentation and your perspective. So if anybody wants to type in a question for Evan into the question box over on your right, uh, we'll start the discussion. Don't be shy. Right now, I don't have any. I think it's because everybody is typing. Um, you have Evan's email. It's D-U-R-L-A-N-D-E-V-A-N at gmail.com. And so if you have any specific questions or would like a link to a paper or something that he presented, that would be a great place. The other thing is, is that we will um, put this recording up on the California Current Acidification Network website uh, as soon as all the processing is done on it on the behind the scenes uh, portion. So it'll be available for you to view at any time. I know there were a number of slides that I want to go back to and think about and look at and listen to your discussion again. So any questions for Evan? So I'm not seeing any pop up, but that is okay. I, I've made sure everybody can communicate. Um, so you talked about larvae being genetically chaotic, you know, having chaotic genetics. Um, you, when you did the mortality studies looking at the, in the various vessels, looking at when ocean acidification or when they weren't maturing, was there any other observations that you made relative to that? Or in, you know, for future work or, or for something as people are, are using these larvae in high and low OA conditions that they should key in on as development occurs. Yeah, um, one of the things that we really, well, I wish we had more time to investigate was uh, <clears throat> we actually saw an increased growth rate of or increased overall size of SPAT in high CO2 conditions. Um, but that is difficult to kind of parse whether that's growth rate or settlement rate. And so I have a suspicion that actually um, the increased size of SPAT in high CO2 conditions might be driven by an accelerated settlement um, rates, meaning that they're actually settling out earlier than their counterparts uh, and thereby entering that SPAT phase sooner. So that was one of my big questions. And that would kind of make sense as a stress response, like larvae that are in an OA condition decide we need to drop out of here. And um, that was an interesting behavioral response from those animals. So that's, I think, something that's ripe for kind of looking further. And I know some people are looking at some of the effects of OA on settlement. Um, right. Yeah. Well, something for another person uh, working with the MBP lines to look at. Yeah. So Caitlin Willig um, has a question. Did any of your work look at the effect of diurnal variations in CO2 levels? No, and I think some of that work is really fascinating um, because that's kind of more environmentally relevant. But no, we, we tried to maintain uh, as stable of conditions as we could get. So we looked at just kind of one set level and carried that through. Mm -hmm. Is that something that perhaps could be done in the future? Yeah, um, and I know some people out at Stony Point have been doing some diurnal work and looking at uh, kind of refuges and understanding how much exposure actually starts eliciting the response. 
Um, and frankly, it, for us, that was a system that was difficult for us to set up. But um, though, I think that that's uh, a very relevant and important place to be taking some of this work and trying to simulate this natural environment more, more uh, completely. Great. So we have another question from Alexis Valuri Orton. I hope I got that right. It seems like the wild oysters had more genetic variation across the larval stages compared to the broodstocks, but there wasn't a significant difference in survival under ocean acidification conditions. Does this suggest that these variations aren't contributing to improved survival? And since the broodstocks aren't varying as much, does this indicate that they are pre-adapted to increase CO2 in terms of their baseline membrane protein expressions? Yeah, those are good observations. Um, so I can say for one that this data doesn't provide us enough information to, to determine overall genetic diversity. I did look at that and see if we could use some of the pool seek data um, and we don't have a significant difference here, but uh, previous work has demonstrated uh, that as expected, our selected lines have overall lower genetic diversity than wild stocks. Um, but in this case, uh, we didn't see that that was correlated to any difference in fitness. Um, I think that when you ask about baseline membrane settings, that's a big question is why MVP stocks uh, outperformed wilds. And actually that's part of the discussion in one of our papers is that really when you look at the data, um, it's that MVP did better overall, period. They also did better in a way, but they didn't do especially better. In fact, their fitness advantage is reduced. So it's my opinion, and we don't have data to, to kind of tease out some of the specifics, but I think that MVP simply after six generations of being reared in a hatchery is fine-tuned for those conditions and can handle some of the other stresses um, maybe a bit more easily than wild stocks. Great. Any other questions for Evan? She says, got it, thanks. So um, with that, I think we will adjourn our webinar today. And if you could advance the slide, Evan. Yep. Um, so just reminding everybody that this is recorded and that we will be presenting it on the CCAN website. If you have any inform, you know, if you're interested in future workshops or past workshops, you can find them on the, the CCAN website. You can also contract, contact our coordinator, Diane Pleshner Steele, and her email is there. And if we go to the next slide, um, our next roundtable will be a different date. It's August 7th, 2019 at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And it is understanding acidification risks across habitats at a 10 site intertidal network. And that is looking at eelgrass and at oyster culture um, in some specific plots. It's with Dr. Micah Horwith, who is with the Washington Department of Natural Resources and the Aquatic, the Aquatic Resource Division. And I think um, folks will find that webinar very interesting again. So thank you to Dr. Derlin for taking the time to offer this, uh, his expertise and perspectives about the genetics of larval fitness in the Pacific oyster all the way from Sweden for us. And thank you all for taking the time to join us. This is the end of the session and we hope you join us again on August 7th. Thank you. Thanks.